Hey there, welcome to this Django Crash Course. The main purpose of this video is to introduce you to Django and show you all the concepts you need to start building your own project using Django. In this tutorial, we're not going to be building any full project, but what we're going to be doing is taking each Django concept step by step, using it in a practical use case, and then by the end of this video, you will know how to build your own project using Django. Now this tutorial is mainly focused for beginners because we're going to be starting from the basics up to the more complex stuff in Django. So a quick introduction to Django. Django is a Python web framework. This means that using Python, we can build web applications with Django. So without wasting any time, let's get straight into this video. This is a list of what we're going to be covering in this video. And before we get started with this video, I want to say that if you want a free Python handbook, there's a link in the description where you can get a Python PDF for free. So let's get straight into introduction and installation of Django. Now, the first thing we need to do is to install and set Django up on our computer. So I'm on a Windows, but if you're on a Mac or you're on a Linux, the installation process is quite similar, just only some differences in the command line. But I'm also going to see what you need to do if you're on a different OS from mine. So this is just the Django official site. But now before you need to install Django, before you can install Django, you need to have Python installed on your computer because we're going to be using a Python package manager called pip and that pip only comes when you have python installed and django is a python framework so why not so if you don't have python installed just go to google and then it's very easy you can just search python download and then just click on the first website yeah so you're going to see the latest version here and you can just easily click on this to download it now when you download it, you're just going to install it like a normal application. So I'm not going to do that because I have that installed already on my own laptop. So if you don't have this installed, just come here, download it, and then everything is going to be fine. So now we can quit this tab. So now we have Python installed on our computer. What we just need to do next is to open up our command prompt. Now these are command prompts where we are going to be doing most of the server running the installations and everything we need to do in our django project so the first thing we want to do is to install django it's very easy what we just need to type is pip install django now this command line is going to install django on our computer so it's going to install django on the system so we can access it from anywhere but I have Django installed already. So what it's going to tell me is requirement already satisfied. If you work with Python very well, you know that once you have a Python module or library or package installed, it's going to tell you requirement already satisfied. So as you can see, it says requirement already satisfied. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to close this and then just keep it like that. Now you can see that we have Django installed on our whole computer and the version that is going to install is the latest version now i'm not really sure if it's 3.2 or 3. Point, but i know that we're on django 3 or so right now and that is what is going to install the latest version but let's say for a different project for each django project you want to have some particular packages just for only that project not for uh, on your entire computer or you want to have a different django version just for a specific reason on each project now, what we need to do is to create a virtual environment. Virtual environment, I'll see it like a little box where everything in your project is stored in. So it's just like a mini environment where you can access everything about your project. So the Django version of that particular project can be different. The whatever version you are using for any other package you're installing can be different. So it's just for that particular project is not going to be available in the old computer so for you to do that you need to 
first of all install a virtual environment on your computer now there are countless virtual environments you can have the one i use that i recommend is called anaconda but that also has its installation process and that is mostly using um anaconda is using machine learning because of the packages that comes with it but for this project we're just going to stick with a very simple virtual environment and this virtual environment is very easy it, we, we are just going to install it on our command line right here but if it's anaconda you have to download the application just like we did for python and then install so if you want to check that out there are countless tutorial series on youtube about it you can check it out but let's just install a virtual environment right here on our command line interface and this virtual environment is called virtual env wrapper so to install it will say pip install virtual env wrapper and then after doing this we'll put an iphone and then we'll say win now this command line is going to install it on our computer so again i have this installed so it's going to tell me requirement already satisfied but for you it should say you should go ahead and install it or just say show the loading bar downloading or something like that now note that if you're on a mac when you are installing all these packages you need to type pip3 so you can see that right here on the windows we type pip install then we type the package name but if you're on a mac you type pip3 install then the package name so that's just the main difference within the windows and the mac installation so now that we have this virtual environment wrapper installed let's now go ahead and create a virtual environment in Jan for our django project so for us to do this we're going to say mk which is short form of make then virtual env so now when we say mk virtual env then we're going to leave a space and then we'll put the name of the virtual environment so um you can give it any name let's say you are working with a project named online dictionary that's your django project you can also give the virtual environment name as online dictionary so just so that you can easily access it whenever you want you can give it any name you like but i just personally love giving it the name of my project but now let's just give it a name of um, my app so mk env my app then we can hit enter now this is gonna create a virtual environment named my app and then once it's done creating that particular virtual environment what it's gonna do is is automatically going to activate that environment so this will take a few seconds as you can see uh, we have this installed already and then before we installed it beside the directory of where we are we didn't see anything yet but after now you can see we have my app so this is showing you that it has it has created that virtual environment called my app and it has activated it so as i said you remember i said that when we're using a virtual environment it is like a different box from the old computer but before we can access that box or before we can access that small environment we need to activate it so now that we've activated this virtual environment we can anything we are doing in this particular command line is going to be in that virtual environment so now i'm going to install django and when i install django by saying pip install django notice that if you're on a mac you should say p3 install django so now when i install django and hit enter it's not going to tell me requirement already satisfied again and by now you should know the reason why that's because we have django installed on our computer but we don't have it installed in this virtual environment which is separate from what we have on our computer so as you can see it is installing django again which is let's see if we have okay yeah it's installing 3.2.2 the latest version so that is the difference between your virtual environment and your normal computer environment or whatever you want to call it but as you can see right here we add this environment as we created the virtual environment it automatically activated so for you to know if you've acted if you are in a virtual environment or if that environment is activated you are going to see this bracket and then the name of the environment in it before the directory so you know when you first open your terminal or your command line 
the first thing you're going to see is the directory but if you're in a virtual environment you will first see the name of the virtual environment in brackets and then the directory that's to show you that you are in that virtual environment but if we close this command line now if we close this command prompt now and come back you know we aren't going to see this my app again so how we will now tap into that environment how will we activate or enter that environment so i'm also going to talk about that in a few minutes so for now you can see that we have django installed in this environment that's very good now well enough of virtual environments for a while let's move straight to django we have django installed the next thing we want to do is to create a django project because we want to work with django now django has this command line which allows you to create a project a new project so first of all you need to make sure that you are in the directory you want let me open my folder real quick so this is my folder this directory is what is in this command line so you can see right here project slash django tutorial if i come here you see that i'm in project django tutorial so this command line that is open is open in this directory so anything i'm creating if i'm creating a new django project is going to be created in this directory now i'm just going to say django hyphen admin start project and then let's give it a name of my app so or oh, yeah my app is okay or my project let's just give it my project so you can see now we have the virtual environment in my app and then this is the command line that we are going to use to create a new django project so once i hit enter and i'm just going to give it a few seconds so you can see it didn't show anything here but if i come back into this page you see now that i have a new project named my project so let me come back real quick what we did was django admin start project my project now this is going to allow us to create a new project django admin start project then the name of the project after so if you are working on let's say an online search engine and you want to name it uh, ging search or tommy search or whatever you want to name it so you can say django admin start project then online search engine or whatever you want to name your app so that is how to create a simple django project now if i press dir i see that i have a new file a new folder here let me opt into that folder cd my project so now i'm in that my project folder if i press dir again you can see i have manage.py and my project so i'm going to explain all this it might look confusing at first i'm going to explain all this i promise so I'm just going to quickly explain how you can also do all these things in Mac. Now, creating a new project is exactly the same thing. Just type Django hyphen admin start project my project. Exactly the same thing. And then right here, when I press DIR, what I did was to see all the files and folders in this particular directory. So if you're on a Mac, what you need to type is ls. Once you type ls, let me just quickly type it right here ls so this if i click enter is not recognized because i'm on a windows but if you're on a mac it's going to show you a list just like this of all the files and folders you have in that directory and what i did was to go into that my project folder exactly the same thing with mac just type cd my project it's going to go in there so now we have this let's quickly come back let me go into this project what do we see here we see a file name manage.py and then we see a folder with which is given the name of our project which is my project now let me open it and we see like a bunch of files here now i'm going to explain all of this but before i do that let's bring this our project into visual studio code so now we have talked about doing everything in the command line interface creating the project but what if we actually want to code so we need a tool uh an ide a code editor whatever you want to call it and the one i love using is visual studio code so you might want to use atom you might want to use pycharm you might want to use what else you want to use sublime text but i use visual studio code anyone you want to use is fine as long as you know how to use it so now i have visual studio code here i'm just gonna say 
from here click on file and then i'm gonna open up a new folder i'm not up yeah i'm opening up a new folder so it should be in project django tutorial my project so i'm gonna open this folder up select folder that should take a few seconds uh, that's why I like Visual Studio Code because it's really quick and lightweight compared to some other extent from other IDE. So this should open right now. Let's just give that a few seconds. And yeah, yeah. So as that is opening, let me quickly say something. So it has opened right there, but let me just close this. So remember that I said that what if we want to access this particular virtual environment? Let's say we close this command line interface and want to access this virtual environment. I'm going to show you how to do that in our Visual Studio Code. So let's just come here. So first of all, this is the files we get when we create a new Django project. This money.py file, you don't want to touch it throughout your whole coding throughout when you're building anything you're building it is i uh, i personally i there might be some developers will manipulate this file but normally as a beginner even as an intermediate django developer you don't want to touch this file there's nothing you want to do here this file is just to allow us to do several things in our project like run our project on the local host so we can see what we are building migrate databases and i don't want to get into details because you might not understand now but you understand later but for now you don't want to touch this file so let's just close that up and then when we come into my project we have an init file yes um this file is empty for now uh, there's nothing much to explain in this file let's just leave it like this so we're still going to use all these files later in this tutorial so i'm just showing you like a boilerplate that django brings up when we create a new file so we're gonna use this ASGI. Yeah, it's an important one. It, we don't need much manipulation in this. It's just one line of code or something just to access some socket and stuff. So just leave that for now. And then this settings file is like the bedrock of your whole project. So if you do anything wrong in this settings file, it's gonna affect your project. So we need this file. We need this file a lot. We're gonna use it to like this installed apps we're gonna do some things in it this we scroll down we'll see where we have templates this is empty for now we're gonna do some things in it and then we keep going yeah we're gonna do a lot of things in this settings file it's just the file that has all the everything we need in our project so all the configurations any apps for installing anything all our databases is inside this file we're gonna configure it so now we have this urls.py file. Now let me explain what this urls.py file does. This url.py file, what it does is, we're gonna come in here and then we're gonna specify all the urls we want in our project. So for example, let's say we have a website named www.codewithtomi.ml. Now we have that website. When a user just comes to codewithtomi.ml, what page do we want to open? It's here we're going to specify it. But what if a user goes into codewithtomi.ml slash newsletter or slash blog post or something? Now, slash is another web page, another URL. It's here we're going to specify it. It's here we're going to configure each URL we have in our project. So we're also going to go talk about that later in this course. And then this WSGI. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the SGI, but for now, we're going to leave this. So, right, we have all this. Now, what I want to do, I actually love working in this command prompt. But what I want to do now, first of all, I want to deactivate this virtual environment. So, it's very easy. All I just need to do is type deactivate. Now, you can see we're not in that virtual environment again. But now I'm, I'm away from that virtual environment. How can I access it back? Let's come into VS Code. In VS Code, we can have our terminal, our small terminal right here. So we don't need to jump back to command prompt every time we need to do something. So right here, you see that we have this terminal. 
I'm just gonna give it a few seconds to load up that shouldn't take long so right here in this terminal we're going yeah this is it we're going to access our project is ready in this our project directory now let's say we want to go into that virtual environment very very easy what we just need to do is to say work on let's remove this and then we'll say the name of the virtual environment the name of the virtual environment was my app now normally we should have something like this right here but well, it's not here so let's come into our uh, command prompt and say work on my app so right here you can see that it brings out the virtual environment back that's showing that we are in this virtual environment so in vs code it is supposed to do the same thing but i'm sure that is because it's using maybe another type of command line interface or something else but yeah that's gonna be a minor problem we can just overlook that but this is how we can deactivate from a virtual environment and go back into that virtual environment it's very easy so let me just quit this now you, what we did was we created a new Django project we installed Django we talked about virtual environment I explained all the files of these files which was created when we created a Django project I explained the command line interface we've done a lot uh, to introduce Django so now I'm sure you should at least have a grasp or just understand what Django is about and now we can start working with it. So now that we have our Django project created, what I want to talk about is the Django app. Now this might sound funny but there is a difference between your Django project and your Django app. I'm going to explain it using a popular site now the Django apps are like subsets of the main project we have this project created right here inside this project we can have multiple Django apps so they are like subsets of a particular app but why will we use a Django app when we just already have a project right here now let me use for example like instagram.com to explain so we have Instagram we in Instagram you know that we have different sections we have the feed the photo feed we have the marketplace we have the direct messages we have the story and plenty other things so instagram might be the main project just if we are using django for this example let's say instagram is the main project then where we have the direct messages that can be a particular app another app just for only that direct messages we can have another app for the marketplace we can have another app for the reels we can have another, have another app for the stories. We can have another app just for the photo feed. Now, each app can just have a particular function it's doing. Now, in plain, most projects, you won't have too much apps. You might just have one project and one app. With the projects I've been doing, that's what I have. But if you like have a very big project that you want to do that will require plenty apps, there is no problem doing that. So that's what apps are in Django. They're the main project and they are the subsets of that project, which are apps for different features. You can also have one app, one project and one app. And in that app, you can just have multiple features there. That is also totally fine. It depends on how you just want to arrange your project. But one project and one app at least. So, but how will we create a Django app? Very easy, just like we created the Django project. First of all, we need to make sure that we are in that environment and then that we are in the directory of our project, the root directory. Now, when I say root directory, what I mean is the directory which contains the money.py file. That is a root directory of this Django project. So we can confirm if we're in this the root directory by saying dir. So we see money.py. This tells us that, yeah, you're in the root directory. Now, to create an app, that's when we use this manage.py. In earlier, I explained that this manage.py, we don't really want to code anything inside it, but we use the file a lot for different things. Now, creating an app is one of the times we use that manage.py file. We just say Python manage.py start app. And then we can name this my app since we have my project and we can just name it my app. 
and then when we hit enter it's not going to give us a response right here on the command line interface but if you go into our visual studio code if i come here you see now that i have a new folder named my app and on that here i have a new another folder and a bunch of files so let me just quickly go around and explain this so this in it and we really don't do much inside this it's just for the migrations for the models you're going to understand that later now this admin.py django has this built-in admin interface which allows you to control your site or maintain your site you view all the databases everything you need to know about your site and this admin.py file is where we register some database we want to put in there and some other things we want to do and then this apps.py file we also use it but not too much but let's just keep that and then this models.py file is the file where we create all our database now dealing with database in django is quite different because we don't need to write a single line of sql code i'm also going to explain that later in this course and that's what the models of py file is for the test we we use it in some cases but not all times so it's not frequently used and this views of py is where all the main thing happen so we're going to look at this views of py in this video this is where we're going to start from so now let me just quit this and now i have all of these now let's say we want to start with the urls configuration now the urls configuration when i say that what i mean as i explained earlier i said is let's say you have a project and then each each link let's say you have a website like youtube.com then each particular link is a different url so that's what the urls configuration is about you're going to understand that in a bit so what we just want to do now is to configure urls let me just make this more understandable so we have this django project.com website if i click on overview or i click on download let me come here and click on download now you see i have django project.com slash download this slash download is another url this django project.com the main one is the main url that's the url when what the user should see when it enters our site and we have slash download is another url we have to configure all of these inside our django project that is what is called url routing or url mapping or url configuration you can call it anything so to start with this we're just going to come into my app and then in my app we won't have a urls file so we're going to create a new file and name it urls.py and we need to import something from django called path so say from django.urls import path now this path is going to allow us to add multiple urls in a list so we need to have a new list called url patterns and this list is going to take all the url we have in our project so we can say path this is how we specify a new url and then i just have two I think those are called the uh, quotes or whatever they are called and then for now let's say views dot index i'm going to explain all of this and the name equals to index so we imported path from django.urls that is what allows us to configure each url you can see we are using the path that we imported and then we just have a new list named url patterns and then we have multiple like if we want another url we can just add a new url new url like that that is to show that it's a list now we use path and we open a parenthesis and then we have this empty code or uh, yeah i think then when it's empty that means that is the root url let's say we have something like slash download slash download now means that when a user goes to our website slash download then this is what you happen so but for now when it's empty it means the like come back just the main site the main project where we say slash download it means our site slash download so for now this is just the main site and then views.index 
so the way url works in django is that we in this urls of py file we configure the urls but when a user comes to this particular url what should happen now that is going to be done in the views.index we might render an html file we can just send a resp an http response a json response we can do anything so that is going to happen in the views but before we can use that views we need to import it so we can say from let's import just make sure that's correct import views so now that we have views imported we can say views.index what does this index mean it means a function so this views we imported is basically just this views.py file here when i come here i'll have a new function named index just take a request i'm also going to explain all of this and then i can pass for now so right here i have a function named index so whatever we do in this function is one is going to be assigned to this particular url so this is the way it works a user comes to this url and then it sees that it needs to go into views and looks for look for a function or a class or whatever called index and then whatever is done in that index is what is going to be rendered to the user and then we're just going to use name you can make this name anything you can name it index or home but it's advisable to name it the same thing you're naming that particular url so you don't get confused or stuck or just get some kind of errors so this name is just to give this like a kind of id it's just a name so later you are going to see why we put give a name but for now we leave it like that so let's save this file so as I said, once the user comes to the home, it's going to go into views.index and then whatever we do in this index is what is going to be rendered. Now, what we just want to do, since whatever is done here is what is going to be rendered, let's do something. Let's return something. And we can just return an HTTP response. So before we can do that, we have to import it from Django. So from Django.http import http response and now we say return http response and then this http response is gonna be can be like an just an html tag like an h1 and then you can say hey welcome and then we can close that h1 so you are just having a simple html code inside this now if i run my project i'm also going to show you how to run your Django project if i run my project you are going to see that we don't have anything so let's first of all run our project before we continue let's come back into our command line and say python manage.py run server now remember i said we're going to use manage.py file a lot in our command line so for us to run our project on our local host so we can see what we are building we need to press python mining.py run server i'm going to hit enter and then you are going to see what's going to happen it's going to run our project in localhost with a port of 8000 so we just need to copy this and come into our browser and then just paste it so let's just wait for that to load so you can see what it shows us what it shows us right here is the default django template of a new project so when you create a new project and you just run it this is what you are gonna see but obviously we don't want to see this what we want to see is our own website our own template our own html file our own response whatever we want to do so now let's come back to visual studio code but we've done everything here we've said that when a user come into the home page you should go to the view.index and in the view.index we're just sending an http response which is a hey, welcome so this year is supposed to show a hey, welcome why not now this is because everything we've been doing since has been inside this app this my app but remember i said my app is just a subset of the main project we also need to tell the main project where to look for the home url so that is how it's gonna see it so what we're just gonna do is to come into my project and write in urls.py we are gonna first of all import something named include so from django.urls import path and from django.urls we can also import include now this is going to allow us to include 
a similar URL from an app. So I'm going to say path, just like I'm making another URL. Same thing, but right here now we are not saying views or anything. Since we've already configured that in the app, we're just going to say include my app dot urls so if you know python very well you should uh, kind of understand what this is doing here what it's doing is that is including my app dot urls so it's going to go into my app right here dot urls which is this url file and it's going to look for a similar url to this so anywhere where they see this home what is being done there is what is going to be rendered so now we can quit this now if we come back here and hit refresh, you are going to see now that we have a welcome. We don't have that default Django template again. What we have now is this particular HT, this particular HTTP response. So that is basically how to do a basic URL routing. Now there is more to this URL routing that we're going to talk about later in this course. But it's how to just basically do a simple URL routing in Django. Till this point, we have seen how to get rid of the Django default templates for when we just create a new Django project, that template that's going to show. We've seen how to get rid of that and input our own response. So as you can see, right here it just says, hey, welcome. That was what we did right here in Visual Studio Code. We just returned a simple HTTP response with an H1 HTML tag saying, hey, welcome. But now we want more than this. We can code all our HTML in here. We can put all our p tags, all our forms. If you know HTML very well, you know what I'm talking about. We can type everything in here. We want to have our own external HTML file, which we want to render when a user wants to access this index page. Now that is easy. Django is quite easy. What we just need to do, we need to configure Django to be able to see our HTML files to be able to see our template files or to be able to locate those files that's the right word so when we request for let's say index.html Django knows where to locate that file and then it renders it let's do that quickly let's close this up we can close this up also so right here in our root directory remember I said the root directory of a Django project is the directory which contains the money.py file night here we're gonna create a new folder now this folder is gonna be called templates and in this folder we're gonna store all our template file that is all the html files we're gonna use in this project but if i just store my template file right here and i come here and i say okay django show index.html we just created a template file, but we didn't tell Django that this is where it has to look for index.html or whatever template file we are using. So we need to tell Django that. And we're going to do that by using this settings.py file in our project folder. So we're going to have to open settings.py and then we're going to scroll up. And then we're going to come, let's just make this full screen. Right here where we see templates. This is the configuration for the template. I'm gonna look for where we see dares. So this dares is short form of directory. So I'm saying which directory should Django go into to look for the template file. So it is very easy since we already have the template folder here. We're just gonna say base there, comma, and then we're gonna say template. Now, this template must be the name of this folder. So, what we're saying is that it should go into the base directory, which is also the root directory, and look for a folder named template. Now, let's say we name this template without an S. We also need to come here and remove that S and name it template. So, whatever you put here must correlate with whatever is the name of the folder. Now, we can just save this. Now, Django knows where to look for our template files. Let's just close this up. What we just want to do now is to go into that template folder and create a new file named index.html. So in this index.html, we can have our h1 now with a normal 
HTML file in under my HTML file and then we can just say let's say how are you doing today so in our views now we don't want to be returning this HTTP response what we want to do is to render this HTML template Django knows where to look for the template everything is simplified now we can remove this HTTP response and say return render it's taking a request and then we just put index.html which is the name of the file or we'll try to render which is right here so we have our function name index which is having a request now it what it returns is that is rendering index.html now let's save this file and then we come in here and then we hit refresh so this should change um let's go back so it hasn't changed right yet let's see why let's come here and make sure let's break out of the server and then let's run it again so let's give that a minute to run and then let's come here and hit refresh so you can see now it says how are you doing today so this shows that it is coming from our index.html file not from an http response now the reason why it didn't load before i'm sure that it has been cached or something so when we opt out of that django or when we close the server and we started it again it reloaded so sometimes you might need to do that so you see now it says how are you doing today we can just have an image in here save it we have that saved and we can hit refresh and then you can see that that image loaded so it's typical html so we can close all this now so now you've seen how to render an html template or template file in a django url so up to this point you should start to understand how to work with django how to create a new project you should know the difference between a Django project and a Django app. You should know how to go about the URL configurations. You should know how to set your views, functions. Then you should understand the Django template rendering. Now we want to talk about sending dynamic data to your template file. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by this. Let me come into my Visual Studio code. Right here, I just have the plain text named, how are you doing? Let me explain the difference between static and dynamic. And when something is static, it means it, 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 it is the same. But when something is dynamic, it means it changes to a particular, let's say to a particular function or whatever is given and I'm, I'm gonna explain this more when we're doing the practical things now this how are you doing it is static it's just a static text right there now we say that because if i reload this page is there there is it is not changing it's just there because that's what i gave it when something is dynamic it might be like a variable it's, it is different for each user so just like when you come into facebook.com you see your name they can say welcome tom if that's for if that's your name and then if someone named john login you'll see welcome john but when you go to facebook and you see your news feed you will see news feed of your own friends not the another person's friends or there are, there are countless ways you can think of it so that is what dynamic stuff is now that happens because of it is actually the same page like the same html file or the same whatever the same code but it's different for each user and that is what we mean by dynamic when something is not the same for everybody so we're going to talk about sending dynamic data to our template file what i mean is in django because django is a back-end framework we implemented some 
programming functionalities in the HTML. Some things like variables, something like if statement, some things like for loops. We're able to code that in HTML using some particular language. Some is a template language called Jinja. I'm going to talk about that later. For now, I would like to send this whatever I call it, this dynamic data to my file. What I just need to do, let's say here yeah, I have a variable called name. Let me just say this name is John. Right here, I can say welcome uh, John. Let me just say John and save it. It refresh. Welcome John. So this is static because it's John. If another person named Tim login, it's gonna say John. If someone else named Rose login, it's gonna say John. But if we come here now, let's change his name to like Patrick. I can send this variable into my index.html file and I can access it from here. I can do this by just coming after the index.html. You just have the curly braces and then the name of the variable will be name and then we're giving it this name variable which we have here so this is like the key and value it's like a dictionary so this is the key this is the value now i'm going to be able to access this variable because of this key in my index.html if i come here now instead of saying john to access that i'm going to use the curly braces twice and i'm going to say name if i save it right here now so as you can see now it says welcome patrick now this patrick is coming from our backend it's not coming just as a plain text right here we are saying name but what is printing there is patrick that is because that is what we assigned it right here now this can be different for everybody when we go further you are going to see how we are going to use user authentication to have each user to have their own data now let's say this data is coming from a database let's say we log a user in and then we get this name and let's say it will be something like user dot name let's remove this and something like user dot name so now this name is giving a value of user dot name which is now coming from the database so it will be it will be different for every single person so if it's john that logs in to say john if it's team that login is team that will be sent into the front end now that's how we send dynamic data using django in django but now we can also send make this more formatted like let's say we have multiple it's not a good practice to come in and do comma and say um age and then give it no that you can also do that but that's not a good practice so we can just have something we call context that is popularly used in Django, and this context is going to be a dictionary. In this dictionary, we are going to just have all the fields we want to pass. Let's say name, and then we we'll just give it Patrick, and then let's say age. We can give it twenty-three. Nationality. We can say British and then we can just continue like that is basically a dictionary and then if we want to pass this into the HTML we don't need this curly braces again we can just say context now this context is being sent to this index.html file if we come here now and we say name is gonna print the name that is in here which is still Patrick so that didn't change we say welcome Patrick and then let's just give it a break and then we can say you are age years old so now let's hit refresh and you see it says you are 23 years old which is the variable age coming from the views file we can also use that nationality and say you are then we just give it the nationality and you come here and it refresh and it says you are British so this is just how to manipulate the data as you can see different data coming from the back end coming from the views 
now later well i'm going to show you how to get all this from database not just you typing dummy data or static data now i hope you understand and you get the concept of sending dynamic values from your views to your template file in django now we're going to take some of the fixtures we've learned in the previous part and then with some new fixtures and then we're going to use it to build a very simple word counter in django so it's just a very small project in which a user is going to be able to put a couple of words there or like a sentence or an article and then once the user hits submit it's going to show the user the amount of words that are present in that bunch of text so let's do that the first thing we need to do let's quickly come to our server which is running right here so we want to have like a form right here which a user will be able to put all the text in and then we should have a submit button beneath it so let's do that first of all so right here in vs code we can get rid of all these right now and then let's just have a form can just leave it blank for now okay so in this form let's have a text area and um let's give it a name of let's say text that should be fine and then let's have a submit button type should be submit but here yeah, we can have a break so now let's save this and it refresh right here so this is just what we have now let's see if we can add something like row rows and then let's say 10 just to give it okay longer I think there's something like columns, yeah, calls. Let's give it 10 also. We hit refresh. Okay, so let's make this like 25, 25. We hit refresh, good. So let's just make this a little bit bigger, like double of it, 50. Let's see, okay. So I think this is good and then right here we're not really specific about the design we just want to know how to add the backend functionalities so let's come up here above the form and write let's have an h1 which just says input your text below so now this is our form let's hit refresh and just see good so this is our form right here and then this form let's give it a, a method if you know html you know that there are two methods when you are submitting a form which is the get and the post so we're going to leave this blank for now and we're still going to talk more about get and post method when you're dealing in django so we're going to talk about that later but for now we're going to leave this blank so what we want to do now is that once you put the text here and it submit note the url we're still in this url this page and then it just passes some data everything which was written in this place when i hit submit you see now that, that is passed into the url and it's saved in like this variable or this key named text and the reason why it's saved in text is because we gave it a name here of text if we give it a name of words and we come here and hit refresh and we'll say hi how are you doing and then we come here and hit submit you see now it's saved in a variable or a key of submit with all these values so now that all these things are being passed to the url it's very easy for us to now get all these values in the back end so let me explain what we're gonna do so once the user hits submit we want to send it to another url right here you can see that it's just sending it back to this home page we're going to create another url maybe like a, a counter maybe like slash counter that url is going to count 
the amount of words and then it's going to send it back to the template file and then showcase the amount of words for us so it's going to make sense in a bit let's just do that so first of all we're supposed to have an action action is where we want all this data to send to so now we don't really have any other url let's go and create that so right here in urls.py let's have another url and then we can just name this counter and then let's say views.counter and then let's give it a name of counter now you know that we said views.counter but if we come into our views we don't have any function there named counter so let's go create that so right here we just want to have a new function named counter and then we want it to take a request now we can also return render a request and then we want to have just the way we have index.html for this page we want to have another html file for this counter let's come here and just create a new file and name it counter.html so that is blank for now let's leave it blank now we can render this counter.html and then we can leave that for now so we don't need all of these again let's get rid of that so now what we want to do is that we want this action to go to counter it's very easy what we're just going to do in action we just put the name of the url which is counter so now once we hit submit it takes all this data to this counter view now let's go test that out we come here and hit refresh um okay no not that like this and then hey what's up then we hit submit now you see it goes to slash counter with these words and say hey what's up now that this counter has this particular data this url can get that data so for us to get this data we're going to come into views we're going to have a new variable and let's just name this new variable like words and then for us to get it we'll say request dot get we're getting words i'm going to explain all this so what we're just doing now is setting a new variable and then we're saying request dot get so we want to send a request to whatever is being passed to this particular view and then we want to get it so and then what we want to get is these words now if we come into the index.html you are going to see that we are sending this particular data into this counter and in this counter we are getting that data so request.get words why we have this word is because it is the name we gave the particular text collector like the text area which collected that data this is the name assigned to it now if we change this to text what we want to be here now should be text so let's just change it to text because that looks more that makes more sense now you see that what we are collecting here should be the same with what is here so because that's a name assigned to it if we change this to like tex now this can't when we try to collect data from it it doesn't see any form with the name of text so it's not going to collect any data when we give it text it's going to collect that data so what we can just do now since we already have that data we collected that data and stored it in this variable name text so what's going on now let's go back to the home page we just write some stuffs and then we hit submit now we collected that data and then this data a and whatever is after it is now stored in this variable name text so you know in python you can there is a way we can count the amount of words present in a text so let me quickly open up my command prompt here and show you what i'm talking about then we'll come back here so let me open my python shell real quick and then let's say i have a variable named text and it has 
a sentence named A. How are you doing? So you can see now that this has one, two, three, four, five, five words in it. Now we can count this by, let's say we can just print it straight and say length of text dot split. So what this is doing is that we're just printing the length of text dot split. Text dot split means get each word present in this text. So once it splits everything into one different value, then it's going to count the amount that is in there. If I hit enter now, um, let's do that again. Okay, so that is because I didn't close the print function. So let's just get out of there and then one more. So now you can see that we have five. So that was because this print is for this closes and this length is for this and then this is for this. So it need to add one more and that's where the show works. So now you see that it prints five. That's because we have five words here. So that's exactly the same thing we're going to be doing right here in our project. Since we already have what the user wrote stored in this variable, we're just going to have a new variable. I'll say amount of words. We can name it like that. And then the amount of words will be the length of text dot split. Like this. So now we have the amount of words present in what the user wrote. And we stored it in this variable named amount of words. What we can just do now is to send this amount of words straight into this counter.html. Very easy. Just have a key and a value. We'll say, don't let us write amount of words. So let's just say amount. And then we want to give it amount of words. Very easy. We've saved that. And then now we can say the amount of words is. And then what is the key? The key is amount. So this is the key, this is the value. And then we use the key to get it. So the amount of words is this. Now let's go back. And now let's write full text that makes sense. So say, A. Hey, are you good? I hope you are doing well. So let's count this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now we hit submit and it says the amount of words is 10. So you can see now that it says the amount of words is 10. That's exactly what we want to happen. So let's just come here and just give this like an H1. Okay, copy save let's hit refresh now you see it says the amount of words is 10 so let's just go back and add something to it let's remove this and now we should have one two three four four with submit it says the amount of words is four so now you can see as we're starting to turn all these our features and all these our django stuff that we're learning into project so you can see now we just built a simple text counter it counts all the text now this can also be very useful you might see it as just a simple project but sometimes you can build it for personal use if you have like a blog post so let me just open up a blog post and then you can copy all the text and then just paste it in it so let's just take something from here and then we can just copy all of this straight okay there's a bunch of code there but you get what i'm talking about and then we come here and paste it in it and then we hit submit and it counted for us 328 words so you can see that it's also very useful sometimes if you just need it so right now we've done this so but there's something i want to talk about more if i hit submit you see that everything that we wrote in that text area in that text box is being sent into the url and it's quite lengthy so as you can see a lot that's a lot and that's the reason why we're able to access it 
but what if we don't want all this to be in the url what if we just want it to be slash counter and it's still gonna be able to count this text without having all this in the url like this without having this we just want this and then want to be able to count it so we're also going to talk about that more in the next part now let's talk about get and post request so in the last part we built this simple word counter where we'll be able to put a bunch of text and then once we hit submit it counts that text for us but you're going to notice that all the text in which we submitted is being passed in this url now let me explain why all this happens if we come back to our code right here in our form you're going to see that when we specified method we left it blank so this method is for you to know the type of request you are using that the type of method you are using in this form so it's either a get method or a post method those are the two types that are being used and a get method are mostly used whenever we are not passing any personal information or any very safe information because as i said it is being shown in the url but if we are using a post method this happens when we use a post method the information in which we are sending is not going to be shown in the url now this is mostly used because if we are using a get method let's say for when a user wants to sign up to a website we don't want to pass the user username and the password right here in the url that won't make sense or a user wants to pay online with his credit card we don't want to put the credit card details in the url that's why we use post method because that is more safe and it prevents some attacks on our website so right here as you can see it was blank i didn't specify any method so when i leave it blank like this in a default automatically it uses a get method so if i don't put any method right here or i just put a method and don't specify it it automatically uses a get method so i can also come here and just type get that is still a get method or i leave it blank it's still a get method but if now i want to use a post method i need to put that that yeah it's post i want to use so i'm going to put post so now we're just going to build this word counter again but now using this post method so you get the concept of post so now i change this to post method let me save this and then let's go back here and hit refresh so now we've put a bunch of text in it and uh it's submit yeah so right here we have this error now it says forbidden csrf token verification field request aborted now this happens because as i said a post method is used for more personal information and anytime we're using a post method django expects us to use something we call csrf token now csrf stands for cross site request forgery so it's like an attack now when you are passing uh, data through urls an hacker or someone that has bad intention on your site can tap into those and get those information but using this csrf token django provides a default csrf token which allows us to prevent that attack so let's just quickly look it up csrf token so this is going to come up as you can see csrf token is a unique secret unpredictable value that is generated by the server side application and transmitted so this is just a boring definition of it but that is what the csrf token does it prevents that so let's open up the csrf yes yeah, csrf attack so let's search attack yep so in a csrf attack an innocent user is tricked by an attacker into submitting a web request that they did not intend so it's like stealing information but when we use csrf token it prevents that so i hope you get what that is for so if we don't use csrf token in django it won't allow our form to work so we need to add that so it's very easy just a line of code what we just need to do is to put two curly braces two percentage signs and type csrf underscore token now when this is done everything is fine if we go back let's hit refresh let's put some 
this in it and then we click submit i'm very sure an error is still gonna come up yeah so it says multi value the error at slash counter so we have an error but now it's not because of our post request we've covered everything for this so this is how to do your post method but why we are getting this error is because right here in our views.py you are gonna see that we say when we want to get what the user sent we say request.get but now we are using post so we also need to do that and just say request dot post is that easy now let's just go back fresh um let's wait for that to reload let's come back okay our page is running let's hit refresh and now we typed three now let's hit submit you see it says the amount of words is three and then our url is completely clear we don't have any information being passed in our url so the post method is very very useful whenever we are dealing with some more safe and secure information so i hope you understood the difference between a get and a post request or post method let's talk about static files in django now when we say static files in Django, what we're talking about is any external file that you use in your template file. Now template files are the HTML file we use in Django. So this index.html is a template file. This is a template file. Now any external file we use is our static files. Like if we have an external CSS file that is linking to this HTML file, that is a static file. If we have an image, if we have an external video, all those are static files. So just the way we configured for the template file, remember earlier in this tutorial, we had to go to the settings of this project and we had to tell Django where all these template files are located. Now we have to do the same thing for the static file. Let me close this up. Let me close all of this. Now let's say we want to add an external CSS to this page. Uh, let me just remove this form we don't need it again and let me say hey welcome to my project now let's say we want to add an external css to this particular file and then we want that css to be linked to it you know in normal html all we just need to do is just have our link tag and then we just specify where the css file is located but in Django, it's quite a bit different. Just the way we stored all the template files in a folder named template, we need to store all the static files in a folder named static. Now let's do that. We create a new folder and we say static. Now this static file, as I said, is going to contain all the external files we need. But now we need to tell Django where to locate all the static files. And then we're also going to do it in the settings.py file. That's why I said earlier in this video that the settings.py file is like the bedrock of the whole project. It is very useful. So what we're just going to do now is to come right into my project and then go to settings.py. So this was where we configured for the template. But for the static files, we're going to configure it down here. But before we come down, we have to go up first of all. And then right here, we need to import something we call OS. So let's type import OS. Now what this OS does is that it gets a specific, the operating system of which we are coding on. Like OS stands for operating system. So this gets it on a Windows or on a Mac or whatever we are on. So now that we have imported OS, what we just want to do is go down and right below static url we can have something we call static files there so we'll say static static files underscore there's with an s i'm gonna say equals to we open a bracket and say os the path the join and then we we'll open another bracket and then we'll say base there and then we just leave like a comma we we'll say static 
and then right here we also leave a comma so what this is doing is that is from the, our os is going to the base directory which is also the root directory of this project so when i say the base there i mean the roots there so right here is the base directory the folder that contains the money.py file is the base directory and then it's going to the folder where we have static so right here is that folder now we have that set up in that folder now we can create a new file and name it style.css so now we have this called style.css let's style this h1 and give it like a color of red so we can say h1 like this yep I say color red so we have that and now we have to link this static right here into this HTML we do that on top of the file and then you know in normal HTML what we just need to do is to say link and then we just say rel style sheet and then we just say f and then we just give it like style.css the name of the file and then we close that but now if i save this and i come here and hit refresh you see that we just have that text which is still black and then the css is not reflecting on it and that is because this link is not seen by django this is still the tag we're going to use but in this href, instead of just writing styles, we need to add something we call static. And for us to use that static, before the name of the file, we'll put a curly braces, a percentage sign, you know, write static. We'll leave a space, add one of the codes, and we'll close it right here like this. So this is how to use static. So like this, Django should say should know where to locate this style.css now if we save it and come here and hit refresh we're going to get an error a template error now we see it says template syntax error at slash it says invalid blood tag on line one did you forget to register or load this tag so now it's saying we forgot to load this tag called static so right here this static why well, it's like a tag that django sees but before we can use it, we need to load it. So that's very easy. We just go to the top of the file. Whenever you want to load something in Django, it needs to be at the top of the file. And we'll say open and close curly braces, percentage sign, and load static. Now when we save this, we come back here and hit refresh. Boom. You see now that it shows it in a red color. That is showing that the CSS is working on this HTML file. It is connected to it. So let's come right here and just change this to like blue. And we hit save. And we hit refresh. You see now that is blue. So that is how to link a static file into your template file. But now let's go further and then let's work on more real projects. So what I want to do now is just go to Google and then download a free HTML template and then I'm now going to show you how to link different type of static files not just only the CSS now we're going to link images maybe JavaScript anyone we download so I didn't prepare for this so I'm just going to search free HTML template and anyone we see we are going to use so let's see let's see I think this should be good and then let's just scroll down okay let's see check them out yep so one of all of these should have a lot okay this should have a lot of css in it and then we're just gonna download it the free one scroll down um okay this is i free let's just scroll all the way up and let's say free html template download or something 
and let's just get one to download and then let's use it in our Django project so we should have the free ones actually so I know one site so bootstrap made yep so this website I know they are free and then let's just come here and get one to download yep 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 and then let's see so let's work with this one page download free download um bootstrap 5 just download when subscribing to the newsletter so let's see okay so it's downloading right here as you can see okay let's give it a second and then that should be done okay so let's just go to the downloads folder and then look for this extract it and then drop it into our visual studio code so we'll know how we're gonna use it so that should be done downloading let's come here we we'll go to downloads one page yep so right here we can just drag this or we can just copy and then let's go back twice or three times and then yeah so right here is the our Django project we paste it in there so that should take a few seconds to paste so now we can close all this we don't need all this again now we can just start with what i say we're gonna do changing different or connecting different static files into our project so this is done and then let's open it up so we have all of these right here good now we come in here we should have that one page here and then we can delete this index.html let's just delete that and then from here one page where we have index.html let's drag it into the template file here we move it so now that we move we move that the next thing we want to do is to just move this asset into the static file because that's where all the static files are located so assets we see the css the image javascript here so let's close this one page for now and then right here in index this is what is going to be rendered when the index page is called index.html so let's close this up and now let's go back to our project and then hit refresh so you can see the title is changed and then we have all of this so you can see that it is linked with the H, the static files but not in the way django recognizes it so all these are linked but not the way django recognizes it so now let's just do change everything we need for this file i'm just gonna come here and do load static and then let's start from here and then can actually make it quicker by using the alt like this anywhere we see this we just put it in there so we just use the alt it's a good trick i use and then we do the percentage sign space static and then we put this right in here and then we come here we use the same thing Now we do it right here at the end of all these files and then we just close it percentage and close so now if I save this and I come here and hit refresh I should see a massive change in the website so you see now we have the preloading tag or div tag or style or whatever is loading and then our page should load as expected so 
that's loading for too long and i'm very sure it's because we've not linked all the files we were supposed to link let's just copy this static and then let's continue linking we continue linking so let's see we scroll down Okay, so now when we come here and hit refresh this should work and it shouldn't load forever good so now you can see that this is what we want right yes so you can see that the website loads successfully so this is how to basically take a template file then with the static it might the static files might be linked differently but that's how to use it or link it in Django now I hope you understood everything we talked about in static files. So now let's talk about models in Django. So in Django, we have something we call the models and these models are mostly used in configuring our database. So most of the times in Django, you don't need to write a single line of SQL code to get your database up and running. That's why we have something we call model view template. So the model is what we use for our database. The view is what the user see and the template is right of this HTML. So from the model, we just pass all our data into our template file. So I'm going to understand all this in a minute. Now, the models is very easy to configure instead of using like a, da uh, a database table or SQL code we're just gonna use the classes in Python to build our databases but for now we're still just gonna be talking about the classes and the inheritance in the view then later on we're gonna move to how we're gonna integrate it into our database so let's go into a file called models.py and this file is always located in our app so right here in this file we can create a new model so by just creating a class and then we can just name it whatever we want to name it let's say like let's come into let's come right here so let's say fixtures right fixture and then we can leave do this like this and then we can give it let's say like an id of which should be an integer and then we can have the name of the fixture which we want to be a string and then we can also have something like the details so we say details which should also be a string so right here what we're having now is the name we have an id and then the details of that fixture so we have this right here now but how can we use this in our views it's also very easy what we just need to do is to come into our views.py and then right here in the index what we can just do is to first of all import that model from here so we can say from dot models import feature now that we have that imported what we can just do is to say let's say feature one should we cause should inherit from the feature model so now that this feature one is inheriting from the feature model we can now easily specify the detail of the attributes of this feature one so we can say feature one dot id 
let's give it an id of zero and then feature one that name let's give it a name of let's say fast so it's a feature i remember that this is a string and then we add one more which was i think details let's yeah details so feature one the details let's say service is very quick so now we have this here and um, we what we can just do now is to pass this into the index of html so we can just say picture should be equal to picture one and let's save it now if we come into index.html and then we look for this so this should be beneath the get started of this so let's scroll all the way up and then yeah get started so that about a minute ago Let's scroll down a little bit. So we should see, yeah, get started. And then, yeah, right here, we have this. So instead of Lorem or whatever this is now, we can just have fixture. This is fixture, right? We come here. Let's drag this beside this because we're going to be needing a lot. So this is fixture. We can say fixture dot name. And once we hit save and come here and hit refresh, what we should be having now is the name which is fast. So let's wait for this page to refresh. So now you can see what we have is fast. We don't just have whatever was there again. And then we can also change the details of that. So let's delete all of these. And then we can say picture. Now we can say picture dot details. And then if we come here and it refresh, you see it says our service is very quick. It has that detail. Now we can also do the same thing for all of these four. What we can do is to come into our views. So we have picture one. We can just copy all these. Paste, paste, paste. Okay, let's take two. Paste, paste. So now let's just change all these to picture two. And then let's change all these to picture three. And then all these to feature four. So now we have feature one, two, three, four. And then the ID should be one, two, three. So this is fast. Let's say this is reliable, easy to use, and then affordable. So now we can say our uh, service is reliable, is easy to use, and our service is very affordable. So now we have all these one, two, three, four. But how do we pass them into the front end? So we can do the same thing uh, doing something like this. So we can change it from feature to feature one. And then right here, we can just say picture two should be picture two. And then picture three should be picture three. And then picture four should be picture four. And then we can come right here and assess it right here and then we can just do exactly the same thing so we change this to one picture one we take this away turn this to let's just change this 
and then now fixture 2 fixture 2 dot details if we save it now and come you see that right here we should have the fixture 2 dot details so you see fast our service is fast reliable our service is reliable and you can see that this data are now coming from our views coming from the back end so let's just do the same thing here and then you can see I'm gonna show you a fault or something that we can do to make this quicker and a better process so I know why I'm doing all this from scratch so we have feature theory and then the details and then we have the same thing right here picture four right here now we come here and it refresh all the data in which we add right here are what have been rendered right here in the view in the template but I'm sure you can we are gonna agree with me that what we just did was time wasting and let's say we want we have thousands of data is this how we are just gonna render them each and it's not possible to make this dynamic right because this is obviously a static data it's just whatever we're passing from the database from here is what is showing here but we can make this more dynamic now when I mean more dynamic, we, we can have just one bunch of code. So you can see that this code is repeated four times in our HTML. We have it here, one, two, three, and then we have it here, four. But now let's cancel all this four. Let's cancel three and leave just only one. So we can see it was repeated four times, but now we canceled everything and we left only one. If I save it and come here and hit refresh, are gonna see that I have only one but hold up I'm gonna show you why I did this in a minute so let's come back here into our views instead of having all these ju just passed in here like this feature one feature two this is probably not a good practice what you can do is to have a list I can name it fixtures And then what you're just gonna pass is feature one, feature two, feature three, and feature four. So now that we have all these, what you can just do, let's remove all of these which we passed, and then let's come back. So instead of feature one, we can just say features, and then we can pass this features so now what you see now we have a list that contains all the data we have so all this data which we have here they are stored inside this list named fixtures now this is a very good process and this is the way you should do it and now we are just passing it to the HTML with the features and features so now in the HTML we can look through this list and get the attribute for each of this list right here so feature 4 has all these attributes feature 3 has all these attributes so from the html we can look through it and get all those attributes we need let's go there and see let's save this so right here what we're gonna do we're gonna look for that particular code block in which we want to look through so we want to look through this particular box so is the amount of data we have that is the amount of box that we show now if you can reason that very well you see that that is now dynamic it depends on the amount of data we have that shows the amount of text or card or block being outputted so and that is this block of code right here so we can do something with a for loop and then we can say for picture in pictures so what I'm doing is these pictures which I pass to the HTML is a list so I can look through that list it is iterable 
so i can say for fixture in fixtures so instead of fixture one dot name i'll say fixture dot name and fixture dot details just the way we do in python and then what we also need to do is to make sure that we end that for loop right here by saying end for because you know in python the for loop is being ended automatically by using indentations so if you get what i'm saying for example if i come here and i have a for loop so i'm gonna have a for fixture in fixtures so now when i just do something i can just pass for now so anything under this indentation is under this for loop but once i come out of that indentation and continue coding the for loop is being broken so only this block of code now is part of that for loop but in html we don't see indentations what we see is just code tags and code blocks so that is what we also need to use to end our for loop if we don't put end for loop here what is going to happen is that it's going to loop through all the whole code below this and then we're going to see all this code multiple times we're going to get all the images multiple times and that is not what we want so let's go back up here and then let's end that for loop so now we loop through that and then just get each of the images each of the names and this and we save it now when we come here and hit refresh you're going to see that this code this block is going to appear four times so you see fast reliable easy to use and affordable so now we're making it dynamic this is what we want so we have just only one code block here one diff tag here but it's appearing four times because we are looping through that that's because we have four values right here one two three four we can also have one more let me just show you that from our back end here we're we not gonna touch the html file but when we come here and hit refresh we're gonna see one more beneath it so let's say we have picture five so let's use our alt so we have picture five and we have this as four and then what other one we can say trustworthy just like that our service is filled with trust so we can also put that into the list so feature 5 and we save it so now we just added a new data right here in this our small database and then i'm not going to touch the index.html when i come here and hit refresh okay so now we got our first error it says local variable feature reference before assignment so let's see where that is coming from so that is just an error because we said pictures instead of picture 5 so that is what we need and then we hit refresh so let's wait for that to load you can see now that we have a new block here without touching the html so that's how easy it is to make stuff dynamic so now if you think about it, it let's say we have all this coming from our database that is how we can make our website very dynamic let's say we want to show a list of users so once a user sign up automatically it's just gonna add right here or something like that you can just make do anything you want and so that is the basics of this models in Django so let's do some more things that we need to know so right here we did a for loop what i want to do an if statement just like we do in python we have the for loop we have the if statement we have the conditional yeah still the if statement but let's also do that in our template file so let's set something like in our models let's have a boolean so let's say is correct or is true So what this I want this to do is let's say is this picture true? Well, let's say it's fast. Now we added a new attribute which is just to show if our website is really fast. If it's true, then it should be true. Unless it's a lie, then it should be false. So that's just the basic stuff of what this is for. And now our website is fast. Let's say 
feature one dot is true and then we'll say true so this means that it is truly fast and then let's just do the same is truly reliable so let's say feature two true and let's say it is not easy to use let's say we're just lying about that so now feature three it is false it's not easy to use and feature four is affordable let's make that true yeah true so now first of all let's come here and refresh and get rid of this trustworthy so okay let's give that a second okay so we just have this and now each of them have whether this feature is true or not we can come here in our html now and say beneath this detail we can have a p tag that says true and then we can have just let's have a p tag that says true but if i save this let's say this come on this feature is true now let's save this and hit refresh right here so you are gonna see that it says this feature is true for each of these features but remember in our database we said that it is not easy to use for easy to use it is false but easy to use here it says this feature is true so how can we fix this how can we get whether a feature is really true or is wrong now we can use the conditional statement so we can say if feature dot is true is equals to true then we want to say the feature is true and then we can also end our if statement so let's do that so two curly braces two percentages sign and then we can say if feature dot is true if it's equals to true then let's say this feature is true and then we need to end that if statement just where i told you that in python we use indentation to end our if statement and our for loop in html in the template file we use the code block or the tag or whatever you want to call it so now we're only getting if this feature is true that's when it says true so let's save it and go check so we is refresh and now we should not see true for here okay so as you can see it doesn't say true for any of this and that is because you know in python when you want to use an if statement you use these columns but right here the boolean even in python we don't need columns when assigning in boolean no that's not column that's the parentheses or the quotes yeah i think they are the quotes so let's save this and this should work it didn't work because we put those quotes so let's hit refresh and each of them should say it's true except for this so you see it says this picture is true this picture is true it doesn't say anything here and say this picture is true so we use an if statement to get whether that particular feature is true and note the fun thing that we're doing here everything we're doing is still under one code block but it's generating different data from that same one code block with different values it's very fun and very good if you think about it but now right here is false let's we also want to have here and say that this feature is false how can we do that just in python we have the if we have the else statement we have the elif else if statement we can do that here also so we can say if feature is true else so else means if the feature is not true then we just want to have this that says come on that says this feature is false so if feature is true say true say the feature is true else that means if the feature is not true then it's obviously false say this feature is false 
Uh, let's come here and hit refresh. And let's see what we have. So now this feature is true, true, false, which is what we want, and it's true. Now this is very, very, very good. That is exactly what we want. And then we can also use the else if in this. So right here, instead of saying else, we can just say a leaf picture that is true is equals to false. Now this should give us exactly the same answer. So let's hit refresh. And you see it says this picture is false. So we can also use the elif statement or the else statement. But most of the times we want to use the elif statement if we have multiple conditions we want to set. But for this case, it's just two conditions. Is either it's true or false? So for that, we can just stick with the else statement. So else, if it's not true, then it's definitely false. Now that is how we can do some basic dynamic data rendering in Django. I hope it has been fun to this point for you. So now I've introduced you to the basics of the Django models. But obviously all these are just normal Python classes which we are inheriting in our views right here. But we can make all these more advanced by turning them into real databases. First of all, let me collapse this and this. So if you come to this root directory, you see that there's a file here named db.sqlite3. So this file is what stores all our database in Django. So when you create a new Django project, in default, automatically, you have your databases saved using SQLite. So as we know, there are various database provider like Postgres, Oracle, MySQL, SQLite, like what is here. So and as a default, Django uses SQLite. And that's what we're going to continue using for this video. Most of the times when you're working with Python, you might want to use Postgres, you might want to switch, but it's also very easy. We might also talk about that. But for now, let's just stick with the SQLite. So, if you want to change this class into a real Django model and turn it to a database, we need to add some things right here. For example, where we have this picture, what we just need to do is to say, open a bracket and say model dot model. Now this converts this basic class into a model. And then whenever we're using this model, we don't need to add an ID again because automatically each attribute or each object has an ID when it's created. So now we can remove this. So now when we have name, we can change this to equals to. So now instead of just writing str, we're going to write something and say models dot character field. Now this models dot char field simply means character field. It means like a string of field that collects characters. Now we're going to open a bracket and it takes one attribute. That attribute is max length. So this max length specifies the maximum amount of characters that can be inside this character field. So for this name, we can just specify 100. It shouldn't be more than 100. And then details, as you uh, might have guessed, it should also be a character field. Now there are various type of fields, a lot of fields in this Django module. There's the integer field, the Boolean field. There is, there are plenty of fields you can use. So character field also the max length. We can set it to 500 because it's the detail. And then for it is true, I'm sure we don't need this again. So let's just have the name and the details right here. Now we can save this. Now there's something we need to do before this can be saved into our database. For now, this is just code in a file named models.py. We need to send all these fields into our database so it can be registered right there. But before we do that, this app which we are doing all our project in, which is called my app, 
we need to register it in our main project settings file so we need to come in here go to settings.py and then we can scroll all the way up and we we'll look for where we see installed apps right here and then we can just add a new attribute and say my app now this is going to add this my app into your main project so you need to add that before you can start integrating databases of this my app into your main project so now we need to migrate this data into our database let's go back to our command prompt and then let's just open a new command prompt and then we come here and then let's just copy let's scroll up so right here um that should be if we scroll up again yeah so that should be right here and then we just go into that so what we want to do now is to type python manage dot py make migrations now what this command line does is that any changes in which we make in the models file so if we come back here you see that we made some changes right here it's gonna like save that changes and then as you can see it says we created a model named fixture so it's gonna save that changes and then for us to send all these changes into our database we need to migrate it by saying python manage.py migrate so it's a two-step method we first of all need to make migrations and migrate so that make migrations we need to do it anytime we add or change anything in this model.py file so if we come here now and remove this detail attribute or let's say we add another attribute we need to come here and do this two step again My, make migrations and migrate so it can be reflected in our database as you can see everything that migrated we have content types auth admin content types authentication all this and then applying my app 001 initial so what this is is this model we have in here so right now our database has been migrated but i'm sure you're like to where where did our database go basically so what just happened right now we have something we call the django admin panel so all these database have been pushed have been moved into this into the sqlite database well, how can we view it and edit it and control it as we like that's where our django data our django admin panel comes in now obviously if you're using postgres or you're using any other interface you can just easily use those interfaces because they are more advanced but because we are starting from the basics of django i would like to introduce you to the django admin panel first so if you come to your project now and then you go to slash admin so your project slash admin and you hit enter you're gonna see what's gonna happen it's gonna ask you to log in so right here you see it says we should log in but with what details we don't have any details we've never added sign up and sign in into our project but this is an admin site it's not your normal site again you've gone into another part of that site only we the developers can get credentials to this particular site and to do that we're going to come into our command prompt and then we're going to say python manage.py create super user now this command line create super user what it does is that it creates an admin user so it's right here you see it asks for username i can say admin and then it asks for email address i can skip that and then it asks for password i can type that again so now this you see it says super user created successfully what i just input i can it has now be created successfully and i can use it to log in here so if i say admin and i come here and just input the password and I hit enter 
this is gonna take me to an admin dashboard as you can see right here so right here i can maintain and control my site any hour i like without even having an external database ui so if i come to these users you're gonna see that i'm gonna see all the users i have in my project so right here i only have one user which is admin and that is me which was the user i created right here in the command line interface so later we are also going to integrate how we are going to add sign in and sign up so once the user register it will be saved to this list we're also going to do all those but what we want to do now we created this database name fixture and as i told you we migrated that into our database but why are we to seeing it here let me explain so this admin panel there's a file in our project which is controlling that admin panel if we come right here you're going to see we have admin.py so this file is where we need to register our models you can see it says register your models here so this model database which we created you need to import it here and register it in the admin once that is done it's automatically going to reflect here so what i just need to do is to say from dot models import feature and then now i can just say admin dot site dot register and then this is just gonna say feature and once i save this and i come here and hit refresh you're gonna see now that i have a new database table name features and then now i have no database right there so let me just create a new database a new data and let me say quick and let me say our uh, product is very fast and then let me just save it so now that i've saved it we have one new object in our database now i can come here since i have one object in my database i don't need to use all these that i created again all these right here so now these are old we don't need all of these let me add another object in my database and say reliable and say we are very 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 reliable and now i'm gonna hit save so now i have two objects but how can i get all this data that i have right here in my views or in my project so what i need to make sure i'm doing first of all is that i'm importing that feature that feature model so this model right here is linked to this database they are linked so once i can access this feature in my code automatically i'm accessing all the values we have in this database now i'm going to have a new file i'm going to have a new variable i'm going to name it picture pictures and i'm going to say picture dot objects that's all so I'm gonna explain what this means. So we have this new variable, and this new variable is getting from this fixture that we imported, and it's saying dot objects dot all. So this fixture that we imported is this database. Now each of the value we have in this database or each of the data is an object. So as you can see, this object one, object two. So it's saying from that feature database, get all the objects we have there get every single thing and store it in this variable and now this variable is a list and then right here we're passing it to the html let's come here and then let's remove this if statement because we don't have a boolean value again and we just have the name and the detail so we're looping through the data we have here now let's go into our project and see what we are going to get so let's see it says fast reliable easy to use affordable and i'm sure this is because we've not saved our files so let's come here and hit save 
and then let's refresh and see what we're gonna get good so as you can see it says quick apparatus is very fast and reliable we are very 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 reliable so there might be some errors in the code as you can see right here and that'll be because of the way we put it here i'm very sure but you can see that those two are shown so let's just have the control z yeah so that was where we add the problem let's save it and once we hit refresh we shouldn't have that styling error so you see we have quick we have reliable so now you see the way we linked from our database right here and we linked it right here into our project so what i'm going to do now is that i'm not even going to go to my code anymore i'm just going to come right here in my database i'm going to add a new data and now let me say affordable and let me say we are very affordable and then when i hit save now you see i have three objects if i come here and hit refresh you're gonna see now that i have three objects which is affordable and we are very affordable so what is in my database is now what is reflecting here because of what i coded so i hope you guys understand and enjoy what we've been doing in this Django course because these are all the basics you need to know to get started really coding with Django so now let's continue with some things we've seen how to create our models we've seen we've talked about the admin panel we've talked about how we can add and fetch data from the database and those are the most important things we're gonna need anytime we are working with any projects in Django but now let's use the if statement just like the way we used before but now we're getting our data from here so let's say if the name is quick then we want to just add something we can do anything so I just want to show this to you as an example so right here we can say We can say if the picture dot name is equals to quick, then we can just say we can have a p and say this picture says our site is quick. And then we can end the if statement. So now let's save it and come here, then it's refresh. So as you can see right here, it says this picture says our site is quick because it sees that the name is quick. So of course, I'm sure it's because there is an error. So let's just do this paste right here. And then let's refresh it again and it should be beneath this so you can see this picture says our site is quick because it gets that the name of this particular data is quick so you can see that that is how it is easy and doable to manipulate your database using Django now this is very important in Django and I hope you understood what we've been doing so far until this point Now let's talk about user authentication in Django. Now when I say user authentication, what I mean is signing in and signing up to a platform. Like when you go to facebook.com and then you sign in to the platform, you're authenticating through your account into that platform. So let's add that feature in this our project. The first thing we want to do is to allow a user to be able to register into our site. Now this can come with a bit of complexity, but just follow me along as we do this. So the first thing we want to do is to have a new URL, which will be named register. So we're going to have a new URL right here. And then it should be views.register. 
and then let's give it a name of register so we can save that and then the second thing we want to have is in the views so first of all we can get rid of these and these and these so let's have a new function and name it register and let's just take a request and for now let's return render request register.html so for now we don't have register.html so let's create that real quick and then right here we just create a new file and name it register.html so right here in this register.html we want to have a simple form so we'll say sign up below now we're going to use the form tag and this should be like an h1 so right here in the form tag we want this form to be a post so we'll say method should be post earlier in this tutorial i talked about why we're going to use post for this kind of form and then the action should still be this register so i want you to come back to this page and then we're going to have an input the type should be text and then let's give it a name of username and then let's close it and before we close it let's give it a p tag so let's say username and then we can just add another one for the email so right here we can say email and then the type of this one should be an email and then the name should be email so if we come to slash register so you can see username email and then let's have for the password so this should be password the first password and the type should be password and the name should also be password and then this should be repeat password and the type should be a password and the name should be like password2 and then let's have one more thing which will be the input for the submit button so let's use a br here so it will look good now let's hit refresh and as you can see we have the username email password repeat password and submit so if we fill this in and hit submit now nothing is gonna happen so let's say uh let's just say team and then rg.co let's give it random passwords and random so if we hit submit nothing is going to happen but it gives us this error and says csi verification field so the reason why it's giving us this error as i explained earlier is because we're using a post method and then we didn't add the csrf token so let's come here and add it real quick so csrf underscore token and we save it so now we have that done what we want to do now is that right here in these views we want to be able to collect these all this data and then that is going to be quite easy so what we can just do is right here we can just say the username should be equals to request dot post and then username so what this line of code does is that whatever we're posting into this register view we want to get it and store it in a variable named username so we're going to do the same thing for the email and then get the email the password 
get the password and then password 2 get it as password 2 so now that we have all these details that we need what we can just do is to save all these details into our database and the database we're saving it in is this database right here users this database so this database is for the users active on our platform so let's go back and now we got this so what we can just do is to just simply say first of all before we get all this we want to check if request the method is equals to post so we're checking if there's a post method being uh, like if this if this page is being rendered with a post method then we want to get all this that means something is being sent to this view but if this doesn't happen that means a user is just looking for the normal register.html template so if it's a post method that means the user has filled in the details and clicked on submit and then is waiting to be signed up so what we can just do now is to just say the first thing we want to make sure is that this password is equivalent to this password we want to make sure that they are the same they are equal so we can do that by saying if password is equals to password 2 so if password is equals to password 2 then we can continue with what we want to do and then before we continue now there are some things we need to import and then what we need to import is we're just gonna scroll down first of all yeah we need to import redirect this redirect is going to allow us to let's say we've created a user successfully and we want to take the user to another page it will allow us to redirect the user to another page and then we want to say from django.contrib.auth.models import user and auth so this user is this basically this user model was seen here and then auth is the function or the method that allows us to authenticate so another thing we want to import is messages so from django dot country import messages and i'm going to show you why we need our messages later on so now that we have all these we can continue with our authentication so we said if password equals to password 2 so if the user that means right here if um okay i know why this is happening so because we are get using a request dot post so first of all let's save this and let's hit refresh and let's see so let's wait for our server to run back up so we didn't use the column right here so after this we should use a column and then let's see okay so let's quickly fix this before we continue what we can just do now is to first of all cut this all of this like this so now when we save this and then we come here let's see now if that's worked okay that worked so we can come here and hit refresh so we have this running let's come back and continue so now we are checking if if password is equals to password 2 so if this password is equals to this it must be equal then we can continue with our signing up process then we want to check if this email already exists because a user might use an email that already exists in our platform 
we want to check if the email the user is providing already exists or not so right now we can just say if user dot object dot filter email equals to email dot exists so this is going to check if the email already exists so if it exists we want to throw an error and say messages dot info request email already used so what i just did here was i said if user dot object of filter so this user is this user model which we imported earlier on and i said that that user model is this user database so we're saying we want to filter the database and check if there is an email which already exists with this email that the user just submitted so if that already exists we want to send a message so this message was remember when i said i'm going to tell you what this message is for so that is what it's for it's just to send a response back if there's an error or anything so since there's an error which is that the email is already in use so we said messages as info requests email already in use so i'm going to show you how to show all these messages in your template right here so if there is any message email already in use is going to show above here in like a red color or something i'm also going to show you how to do that so right here now we said email already in use and then we now want to return the user that means we don't want to continue with the sign up process since the email is already in use so redirect the user back to register so what i just did after sending telling the user what happened we just redirected user back to register with these details right here so the user has to go through that form again and use another email and if so we want to use another condition now and what we just want to do is to check if the username also exists because the things that must not exist is the email and the username we might we can we cannot have one account with two emails or one account with two usernames it just doesn't make sense so you can say elif user dot object dot filter and then username equals to username dot exists just exactly what i did and then if that happens we we'll just say messages that's info and then we'll say request and then we can say username already used and after that we want to return the user to the register turn redirect So now after doing this what we just want to do now is so if password is equals to password 2 then we want to continue with the sign up process and then if user dot object of filter dot exist show the user this error or if the username is existing show him this error else that means if any of this is false what we just want to do is to create the user so if any of this is false that means the username is brand new and the email is brand new and the password is correct then let's just create that user so we can see user cannot be equals to the user dot objects dot create user and now we can say create user in which the username is equals to the username and then email is equals to email and then password is equals to password so what i just did now was i said it should create a new user with these credentials so these are the credentials 
with this credential so with the username equals to this username the email equals to this email and the password i just picked one from this one of these two passwords since they are the same thing so i just picked the first one so now that we have all those details what i just want to do is to go ahead and save that user so i'll say user dot save with the column so now after doing this i just want to redirect the user return first of all to the login so since the user can look has been created successfully then let's redirect the user to the login so the user can try to log in and see if yeah, the he was created successfully so we use the if statement if the password is equals to this and then it should just go ahead and do all this but what if the password is false like if they are not equal then we need to have an else statement that says else if the password is false let's send a message and say messages.info request and then we say password not the same and then we just redirect the user back to the register So after that, we can just say after everything, it should just load this. So if it's not, if request the method is not post and it's just get, it can just do this. So let's see right here, we can say else. Like this. So if it's just a normal request on this page, it can just render this register.html. But now what we want to do is that we want to show all those messages if there is any error. See these messages? We need to show it right here if any error happens. So for us to show these messages, what we need to do is very easy. We we'll just come up here and say, we we'll use a for loop. We'll say for message in messages and then let's have like an h5 that just showcase the message so whatever message is there it just showcases it and then let's end the for loop so end for and now let's just give that messages a simple styling so we can say style and then let's give h5 a color of red that's to show a warning so now all this is working what i just want to do is to come here first of all since i know i have a username with admin i'm going to try to register with admin and then let's say admin at gmail.com and i'm just gonna put random ones and now you see it says username already used that's because we already have admin user right here it automatically gets that this username has been used and it tells us username already used if we do the same for the gmail Okay, right now we don't have any gmail but we can come to this admin user and then let's see if we can edit this admin user and give him an email so let's give him an email and say admin at gmail.com and then let's just see try to save it so now it has admin at gmail.com so let's copy this and now let's try to use that email but let's use a random username random password and we hit enter now what it says is your email already used so it gets all those errors and then pass it for us so what we want to do now is 
let's use a brand new information so we can say team and then we can say team at geo.com it should be at and then let's say just give it some password and hit enter so it says re reverse for login not found i was expecting this error so the user the person has been created successfully if i come here and hit refresh you see now that i have team i have his email address and everything we need but the reason why is because of line 29 where we say return redirect login let's quickly go back there and see what was going on there so in line 29 after saving the user after creating the new user we redirected the user to login but we don't have any login function for now and we want the user to be able to log in so we need to do that next so now to this point we've been able to create a new user that means register a user on our platform and what we want to do now is to be able to allow that user to log in to our platform so when we created a new user and we tested our code we saw that the user was successfully created right here in our database which is team but it gives us an error which says return redirect login so this error is because we don't have any url named login for now so let's go ahead and fix that we're going to create a new url for the login and we're going to allow a user to log into the site then when a user logs into the site instead of it just showing all this dummy and static data let me quickly open our site so quick 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 so instead of showing like one page or something it can just say welcome team or welcome admin or whoever the user is we can do that so let's go ahead and do this so right here what we just need to do is to make sure if we come into urls.py we need to create a new url named path and then let's give it login views.register now views.login and then the name should be login so now that we have this url we need to create a function named login so right here right below the register function let's create a new function for the login that will take a request and then let's pass for now no 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 let's return render request and then login that html so let's copy this and this should be yeah login so let's save that and right here let's create a new file named login.html right in here let's have an h1 which says login now and below it let's have form and then this form we want it the action to be login and the method to be post so now let's have a p tag that says username and then an input tag with the type of text and the name of username and then let's have another one just for the password and then input type password and then let's give it a name of password and then the last one we're gonna have just have a break right here and then another input for the submit so type submit and we save so now we have this page go to login now 
you see now that we have this login page so let's fix this login let's make a user really be able to log in so what we just need to do just the way we did in the views for the register we can just do for the login also we first get if is a post method so say if request dot method is equals to post so if it's a post method then once you get the username which was sent should be request dot post and then username and then the password which was sent also we should be request dot post password so now that we have these two information saved in the variables what we can just do is to say user should be equals to us dot authenticate username should be equals to username and then password should be equals to password so now we want to authenticate with these details now we want to log the user in with these details but before we go ahead and do that what if the user provides wrong information which is not on our database so we want to check for that we want to check if the user is really registered or not so we we'll say if user is not none so this is how to check so what is it saying that if user is not known so if user is none that means the user is fake that means the user is not on our platform but if it's not none that means the user is really on our platform is registered so we can say auth dot login since the, we know the user is real and then request user and after logging the user in we can now redirect the user to the home page but what if the user is not registered so we want to send the messages a message using the messages so messages.info request and we'll say credentials invalid and then we want to redirect the user back to this page so return redirect back to the login and then let's also have else tab and good so now we've done all this and then what we just want to do is to come into our login and also add the messages so we use the for loop and say for message in messages let's have an h3 saying the message and then let's end the for loop so let's just give it a simple style again and then we'll say h3 should have a color of red okay red so now let's just test this out we can come here in our page hit refresh and then let's log in as the admin so we can say admin and then we log in so it gives us this error and as i said this error is because we didn't add our csrf token so let's go ahead and add that right now so right here you just say percentage sign csrf underscore token in small letters now we save that 
and we hit refresh so now let's say admin and then let's say submit and you see now that it redirects me to this page to the home page that means we were logged in successfully but now for me to really know what i'm gonna do is instead of one page bootstrap i'm gonna say welcome whoever the username is so let's do that right here in index let's do for where we see one page bootstrap So we have get started. One page. Yeah, right here. Okay, no, no, no. So this should be eight years. So let's just add a P and see if that is what we're looking for. You can know that this is it right here. So that's not it. So it's the one with space. So this is right here. So let's quit this. So what we can do now, we can use an if statement and say if user dot is underscore authenticated so this is checking if the user is logged in and then if the user is logged in instead of showing one page bootstrap we just want to show welcome and then we'll say welcome the user username so we'll say user dot username so this will get the current user that is logged in and get its username so to say welcome admin but what if the user is not logged in what if it's just a random guest user visiting then we want to have an else statement so then we just end that for end that if statement and if now let's go check this we hit refresh you should see welcome admin so as you can see now it says welcome admin but now let me just copy this url and then open like an incognito tab a private window where no user is logged in you will now see that that will be different so what is going to be written there will be different so that is when we're not talking more about dynamic values the same page the same code the same everything but different output so now you see it says one page bootstrap but right here it says welcome admin if it's team that is logging it will say welcome team if it's john it will say welcome john so that's how you can do simple stuffs like that and then let's go back to our code so right here we've seen how to do this we can also do the same thing for here where we see own services if the user is not logged in like if the user is just here we can change all this to login sign up and then once a user is logged in we can change it to logout so we've talked about how a user can register on our platform we've talked about how a user can log in on our platform but what we've not talked about is how a user can log out so we need to add the logout functionality so a user will just be stuck in our platform or just be trying to clear cookies anytime the user wants to log out so we just need to have like a button here where they say get started and it should log out once we click on it so this is the easiest thing to do in this whole tutorial now we're just gonna search for where we see this get started okay i think this is it right here so you okay, know that's not it let's just search it okay so this is it right here since we already know where it is what we want to do is use that if statement again and say that if the user is logged in then what we want to show there is logout 
but if the user is not logged in what we want to show there is login so let's say if if user that is underscore authenticated that means if the user is logged in i want to show the picture for a user to log out and then this error if i'm going to leave it blank for now i'm going to come back when i've done the url and the views for the logout i'm going to come back and change that but what if the user is not logged in so that will be an else then what i just want to show is this same thing but what i want to show now is login or sign up So now let's check this. When I hit right here, I'm logged in. So I hit refresh. It says on close tag if. So the reason why this gives us an error is because, as I said, we need to end the if statement whenever we finish with it. So end if. Then when we come here and hit refresh again, since we are logged in on this browser, we should see logouts. Good. But if we come to the incognito tab where we are not logged in, we should see login or sign up. Good. So now the same button but different text. This is what I've been talking about when I say dynamic, when I say something is dynamic. So now let's take care of this login, of this logout. First of all, this login should be easy. I can just redirect the user to login. So let me come here and hit refresh. So if the user is not logged in, I can you can click here and take the user to the login. And I can also add like a button below and say if you are not logged in, then if you don't have an account, then create one by signing up now. I can also do that. So what we want to do is log out. Now let's do that. What we can just do is to come into VS Code. And then let's have a new URL, which is path logout views dot logout name equals to logout. And then in the views right here, I can just have dev logout. Which take a request and then what I just want to do is to say auth dot log out request. So this single line of code will log the user out of our platform. And then once the user has been logged out of the platform, we want to return and redirect the user back to the home page. So now let's check this out. But before we can check it out, we need to come to our index and then right here in the logout, we need to link it to logout. Good. So if we come here now and hit refresh. So once we hit logout, it will redirect me back to this page, but now it doesn't show welcome admin and here it says login or sign up. So that's how to do the basic user authentication in Django. Now I hope you got and understood what we did up to this point. So now we're going to be looking at dynamic URLs in Django. So what I mean by dynamic URLs is, so uh, for example, when we have a, the same URL but with different ID passed in it, so let me just quickly explain this practically let's say we have uh this is our website slash tommy taco so our website slash tommy and then this is the profile page for now it's going to give us an error because we don't have any page like that but let's say this is the profile page for this username tommy and then we also have for a username tim and then we also have for a username john so let's say we have for every user on our website, they have 
each profile page so for us to code this it's just gonna be one page we are gonna code but because it is getting different username it is gonna be different output so that is dynamic URL routing different URL being passed or different values being passed in the URL now let me explain this more practically so let's come right here and then in our URLs in our app we can close this up and right here we can do something like path then we can say something like post slash str pk and then we close it so what this means is that we're having slash post our website slash post then slash a string and we are naming that string pk so it's just like uh, a variable so the variable is named pk and is a string if we want it to be an integer we can just say int but i like sticking with string so now we can just add a comma and say views dot post and then we can give it a name of post so now for us to be able to collect this in our views we need to come here now and then let's scroll all the way to the bottom and have a new view and say posts so let's check if it's post with an s so posts and it's gonna take a request and after this view taking a request it's also gonna take that particular variable which is being passed which is called pk and then now what we just want to do is to say so we have this pk and then we can say return render request and then let's say post.html so let's just create a new file named post.html and now let's send whatever value is in that url to this post.html so we can say pk should be equals to pk now let's save this and right here you say the value in the url is pk now let's save this if we come here now and say slash post slash 12 so now you see it says the value in the url is 12 so let's just make this an h1 so now you see it says the value in the url is 12 so whatever is in this url if it's like team the value in this url is team so it's dynamic whatever has been passed in the url so this is what is used in most sites like when you have a profile page which is like john and then you see the name of the person john then for like since we have the username of that person we can use that username to tap into the database and get the profile picture get the age get all the posts get everything we need about that specific user so it's still one same template file one same code but different outputs relating to what is being passed or queried for in the url so that is what we mean by dynamic urls now we can also make this more you can add some more features like right here in the urls we can have our integer here so now this is an integer if we come here and then we hit refresh we are gonna see that it says page not found now why did this happen this is simply because we right here in our code we said we want only an integer right here so if anything apart from an integer is being passed in the url it should see it as not found so it's not part of our code it's not part of our project but if i change this now to 98 and hit enter you see now it says the value here is 98 
that is because it sees what we told it to ask for it sees what we told it to look for so that's the same thing we can do with any type any any data type but the good thing with string why i like using string is because i can put in an integer here in string and it's just gonna see it as a string even if i mean it as an integer so most of the times you want to use string because it helps you avoid plenty errors so you don't want to use integer there and then someone queries your site and say team and then let's quickly change this to an integer and say team and the person comes to your site and then sees this error of course the person is not a developer it's just a user that wants to use your site even if you set the bug to false the person still doesn't want to see an error so most of the times my own personal advice is when you are using your dynamic URL, except you are very 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 specific about it i will advise you to use the string in it so we can also do something like making this more usable so let's change this to string back and then right here so in our let's say in our counter let's just remove all this so let's have a post which is equals to one two three four five and then let's have team tom john yeah that's fine and then we're passing this to counter.html so we pass it right here so now in counter what i can just do is to have a for loop so now i can loop through that post i can say for post in posts and then let me end the for loop what i can just do now is to have a link tag so in this h1 i can have a link tag and say a f let me leave it blank for now and then what I can just say is post. So right here, for me to, what I want to do is that, let me come to counter. So I'm going to go to slash counter. So you can see that I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So correlating to the amount I add in this list. What I want to do is that once a user clicks on the first one, it should go to slash post slash one. And then if you click on like this team, it should go to slash post slash team. So if you know how to do this, then you know how to query it from the database when you just do object.all and then get everything you need. So let's just do that quickly. So now what I just want to do is to say the percentage sign close that and then in it i'm just gonna say url post and then post the id but you know just post yes so like this and then when i hit refresh you're gonna see that the first one is one if I eat the last one is John, which right here is John. If I go back and I eat this, you see it's team. If I go back and I eat this, you see it's four. So that's how to get from like a list and then turn it into a URL. So this simple trick or this simple feature I taught you, it can be used also when you are getting some values from the database and then you can just turn all those into the url so let's say for example you have a blog and each of these stand as blog posts from your database right here so let's say blog one once you click on it you should be able to read all the posts of the first blog blog two read all the posts also blog three and so on and so forth so now i hope you understood what we did in this part So what I want to do now is to walk you through the steps 
of how you can connect another database provider into your Django project. So throughout this project, we were using SQLite, which was provided by default for us by Django. So I said there are other ones like Postgres, Oracle, MySQL, DM2, and there are so many that you can't even think of. For this video, I'm going to be showing you how to connect Postgres database into your Django project. So the first thing you want to do is to go to search engine and just download Postgres. So what you want to type is download Postgres. So this is going to take you to the site where you'll be able to download Postgres, obviously. So yes, this is one postgres.org slash download. And then once it takes you there, you choose the different versions and then different, yes, for different OS. So just click on yours. I'm on Windows. So I already have Postgres installed, so I'm not going to download this. But if you're on a Linux, click on Dix. If you're on a Mac, click on this Windows, Solaris, PSD. And then the next thing we want to download is PG Admin. Actually, recently, once you download Postgres, PG Admin automatically comes with it. But if you download Postgres and install it and you don't see PG Admin, then just come here and download PG Admin and just download the one for your OS. So once you have all those downloaded and installed you can just open up your pg admin so once you open up your pg admin this is what you are going to see so now what you want to do is to open up this server like this and then under postgres sql open up database now if you want to create a new database just right click on this database and hit create and then click on database so now this is going to bring a form for you to create a new database so we can name this database my project and then let's save it so that's going to create a new database for us and then so that should save and once this has saved and created that database i'm going to show you how to connect that database into your django project very easily so this should create let's give it a couple of seconds Nope. so let's see this shouldn't take this long but most of the time sometimes pg admin usually lags or becomes slow due to your system so let's see okay good so that has created we can close this one up and open that so now that we have this opened we know that the name is my project what we can just do is open schemas and then open up tables so as you can see tables is empty what we can do now is to come into vs code and then we want to go into settings.py so we open up our project folder and then go into settings.py so right down below i'm gonna go to where we'll see database so right here where we see database what we just want to do this default we want to change from engine so we can see is django.db.backends.sqlite3 we want to change that to postgresql so like this and then the name should be the name of the database so and we know that the name of the database is my project so right here we just want to have my project and then the next thing that should be there is the user and the user is postgres so just use the user as postgres and then after that is the password
so the password which you set when you first created when you first open up the pg admin is what should be in here so i'm gonna leave that blank for now and then the host for now is the local host so we have all these and then once you have all this in here the next thing you need to do is to open up your command prompt and then right here in your command prompt you need to install two libraries and they are psychop2 so we say pip install psychop2 and then after installing psychop2 i already have that installed so i'm just gonna break that out of it so i'm breaking out of it and then i'll say pip install pillow so these two libraries are going to allow you to be able to connect postgres to your django project without these libraries you're going to receive an error so this pillow takes care of everything let's say you have a database that deals with images or files this pillow takes care of it and cycle to connect them together so you can see this requirement already satisfied I already have that installed so once you have this setup and you have this installed what you just need to do is just say python manage dot py make migrations so before i say make migrations let me come into my code and input my password so And then right here, I'm just gonna say make migrations. And let's see the migrations it will make. So let's give that a couple of seconds. Um, that shouldn't take time. So once this make migrations, it's just gonna it's supposed to just okay no changes detected so python manage dot py migrate so it's performing all migrations but this time around taking it to postgres so now if we come back to postgres and then on these tables now we we'll right click and hit refresh you are gonna see that we now have a bunch of tables even with that model which we created my app underscore picture so if i just drag this down and i say view data all rows so i'm gonna view all the data i have in that pictures um, model under my app so let's wait for that to come up and let's see so this shouldn't take a while it should just take a couple of seconds and it should show us all the database which we've saved from our admin panel earlier on it should show us right here because we migrated everything here and this should be the database it should start using from now on so you can do the same for my sql oracle as i mentioned it should, uh, they are also similar processes and um i'm very sure you might find it cool and more helpful to use some external database provider than just using the default sqlite so so right now this is it and the data output we do not have anything right here but now if a user like if we create a new one now it should show right here so this is how to connect Postgres to your Django project. Now, I hope you understood everything we did in this whole video. And yeah, so um, now I hope you know how to connect the Postgres database to your Django project. So guys, that's gonna be all for this video. I hope you enjoyed this whole course. And if you did, Please don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe.